Five Go to Mystery Moor by Enid Blyton. Anne and George were at Captain Johnson's riding school. They had been there for a week, while Julian and Dick had gone to camp with the other boys from their school. It had been Anne's idea. She was very fond of horses. George hadn't wanted to come. She was sulky because the two boys had gone off somewhere without her and Anne for a change. There was another reason George was sulky. There was another girl at the riding school called Henry. Her real name was Henrietta, and like George, she looked and acted just like a boy. Anne had many a quiet laugh to herself, especially when the two girls each made up their minds not to call one another Henry and George, but to use their full names. Timmy, George's dog, had given up chasing rabbits. And had just flopped down beside Anne and George when a shadow fell across them as someone came round the haystack they were sitting under. It was Henrietta. She held out an envelope to George. A letter for you, Georgina. I thought I'd better bring it in case it was important. Oh, thanks, Henrietta. Look at that. It's from Mother. What'd she say? Father's not well. And she wants us to stay another week. Oh, blow, blow, blow! We'll have to do without the boys for another week now. They'll stay on in camp, of course. Bad luck, Georgina. I know you're terribly bored here. It's a pity you don't really like horses. It's a pity that you shut up. You two girls. Why don't you behave yourselves? Sorry, Captain Johnson. You're always aping the boys. Now give me Anne here any day. What you want is your ears boxing. Did you take that bale of straw to the stables? Just then, a gypsy boy turned up with a horse, a skewbald which had something wrong with its leg. Captain Johnson went to see it. What have you done to your horse this time? It's his leg, is it? You'll have to leave it here, and I'll see to it. I can't do that. We're off to Mystery Moor. Well, you'll have to. It's not fit to walk. Your caravan can't go with the others. This horse isn't fit to pull it. But my dad says we've got to go tomorrow. What's the hurry? Can't your caravan wait a day or two? Mystery Moor will still be there, you know. I'll leave the horse. My father will be angry, but the other caravan can go without us. We'll have to catch them up. Right then.、Uh, take the horse round to the stables. I'll、uh, see to it in a minute. Mystery Moor, what an odd name! And the boys would like that. They'd be exploring it at once, wouldn't they? The girl shut the door on the gypsy's pony and turned to go back. Just then, William, a boy who worked at the stables, brought them another letter. The two hurried into the house at once. George tore open the letter and gave a yell that made Anne jump. <gasps> Look what it says! They're coming here. What? See, joining you tomorrow.、Uh, we'll camp out if no room. Hope you've got a nice juicy adventure ready for us, Julian and Dick. Oh, they're coming! They're coming! Now we'll have some fun. It's a pity we've no adventure to offer them. Still, you never know. George was quite a different person now that she knew her two cousins were coming the next day. She was even polite to Henrietta. Captain Johnson scratched his head when he heard that the boys were arriving, and said they would either have to sleep in the stable or have a tent. Next morning, George and Anne looked up the trains that arrived at the station two miles away. This is the one they'll come by. It's the only one this morning. It arrives at half past twelve. We'll go and meet them. Right. We'll start at ten past twelve. We'll be in plenty of time then. Anne, George. Ah, there you are. Take the ponies up to Hawthorn Field, will you? Can you manage all four of them? Oh yes, Captain Johnson. Come on, George. Let's catch the ponies and take them now. Oh, it's a heavenly morning. They set off with the four frisky ponies, Timmy at their heels. 
but no sooner had they left the stables than the telephone rang. Mrs. Johnson picked it up. It was for Anne. Hello. No, I'm sorry, she's not here. Who's speaking? Oh, Julian, her brother. Uh, can I give her a message? Uh, you'll be arriving at the bus stop at Milling Green at half past eleven. Right. A handcart? Oh, don't worry if you've got bags and a tent. We'll send the little wagon. I'll get George to meet you with Anne. They can drive it in. Right you are, then. See you later. Goodbye. Oh, Henry? Yes, Mrs. Johnson? Where are George and Anne? Julian and Dick are arriving at Milling Green bus stop at 11.30. I said we'd send a pony and cart. Oh, but they're not here. They've gone up to Hawthorne Field. Shall I take the wagon and meet them instead? Yes, do. That would be kind of you, Henry. Uh, you'd better hurry, though. Time's getting on. Julian and Dick had already arrived at the bus stop when Henry drove up. They looked hopefully at the wagon, thinking that perhaps one of the girls was driving in to meet them. But no, it looked like a boy. When they arrived at the stables, Henry helped them down with their things and disappeared to put away the wagon. The boys were welcomed by Mrs. Johnson, who had made them a snack. They had hardly taken a bite before Anne and George came running in with Timmy, his tail wagging madly. Oh, sorry we didn't meet you. We thought you'd come by train. I'm so glad you've come. It's been dull as ditch water without you. Did anyone meet you? Yes, what's his name? Henry. Nice chap. Henry? Did she meet you? No, not she. He. Fellow with a big grin. <laughs> but that's Henrietta. That awful girl I told you about, who tries to act like a boy. Don't tell me she took you in. She calls herself Henry instead of Henrietta, and wears her hair short and... Gosh, she sounds very like you, George. Oh, the beast. She just spoils everything. Hold your horses, George, old thing. After all, you're pleased when people take you for a boy. Ha! George went off to the stable and began grooming a horse so rigorously it was most surprised. She was working her intense annoyance out of herself. Oh, that horrible Henrietta. Meeting them like that. Pretending to be a boy. There you are, George. Oh, hello, Dick. You can help with the horse if you like. Here's a brush. Do you and you want to go riding at all? There are plenty of horses to choose from. Yes. It would be fun to go off for the day. What about tomorrow? Anne told us about Mystery Moor. We could explore that. Right. But not with that girl. What girl? Oh, Henry. No. We won't have her with us. We'll just be the five as usual. That's all right, then. Oh, here's Julian. Give a hand, Ju. Right. Uh, we'll soon have you looking immaculate. <coughs> Who is it, Timmy? It better not be that Henrietta. Oh, hello. I've come for the oats. He's not ready for walking yet. Captain Johnson said he wouldn't be. What's the matter? Why have you been crying? My father hit me. He cuffed me and knocked me down. Whatever for? Because I left the house. He said all it needed was an ointment and a bandage. Well, you really can't have the horse yet. It isn't fit to walk, let alone drag a caravan. But I've got to have the horse. My father will kill me if I don't. What's your name? Sniffer. That's what my father calls me anyway. Let me have Neil's. My father's waiting. Well, I'll come and see your father and put some sense into him. Where is he? Over there, by the edge. I'll come too. In the end, everyone got up and went with Sniffer. They walked through the gate and saw a dark-faced, surly-looking man standing motionless not far off. His thick, oily hair was curly, and he wore enormous gold rings hanging from his ears. He looked up as the little company came near. Your horse isn't fit to walk yet. You can have it tomorrow or the next day, the captain says. I'll have it now. We're starting off tonight or tomorrow. I can't wait. But what's the hurry? The more will wait for you. Listen, father. You go with the other caravans. Go in Moses' caravan and leave ours here. 
I can put it in the shafts later and follow. You make sure you do then, or mark my words, you won't know what's hit you. I will, father. You better, my son. The boys slept in the stable that night, and next day the four, with Timmy, planned to set out for a day's ride. Captain Johnson said he would let Julian ride his own sturdy cob, and Dick took a chestnut horse. The girls had the horses they usually rode. Henry hung about, looking very mournful. The boys felt quite uncomfortable. We really ought to tell her to come along. It seems jolly mean to leave her behind. Yes, I know. I agree with you. Anne, come here. Yes? Can't you suggest to George that we take Henry too? She's longing to come, you know. Yes, she is. I feel awful about it. But George will be mad if we ask Henry. They really do get on each other's nerves. But this is silly. George will have to learn sense. I like Henry. She's boastful, and I don't believe half the tales she tells, but she's good fun. There she is now. Hey, Henry! Coming! We're all going off for the day. Would you like to come with us? Would I like to? You bet! But does George know? I'll soon tell her. Julian went in search of George. She was helping Mrs Johnson to get saddlebags ready full of food. But when Julian said that Henry was coming too, George muttered something peculiar and went out of the room, her face scarlet. Later, William came into the room with a message that George said she had a headache and didn't think she would go on the ride after all. Julian looked startled and upset, but Mrs Johnson had things to say on the matter. Now listen to me, Julian. Just leave George to her imaginary headache. Don't go fussing around her and begging her to come and saying you won't have Henry. Just believe quite firmly in her headache and go off by yourselves. It's the quickest way to make George see sense. Believe me. Yes, I think you're right. I know I am. Soon all four were on their horses and were walking over the yard to the gate. George heard the clippity-clop of the hooves and peeped out of the window. They were going, after all. She hadn't thought they would really go without her. She was horrified. Oh, what an ass I am, Timmy. A great big idiot. Why did I behave like that? Now Henrietta will be with them all day and will be as nice as possible, just to show me up. You don't care how I behave, do you, Timmy? No? Yes? Mrs Johnson says if your headache is bad, you're to get into bed. But if it's better, come down and help with the gypsy's horse. I'll come down. Tell Mrs Johnson I'll go to the stable at once. George went down with Timmy into the yard. She wondered how far the others had gone. She couldn't see them in the distance. Would they have a good day together with that horrid Henry? Blah. The others were almost a mile away, cantering easily. What fun! A whole day before them, on Mystery Moor. I think it's a jolly good name, Mystery Moor. I don't think it looks at all mysterious. Well, it's got a sort of quietness and broodiness, as if something big happened in the past. Quiet and broody? It sounds like one of the farmyard hens sitting on her eggs. It might be a bit frightening at night, but it's just an ordinary stretch of countryside in the daytime. What's that moving over there? It's caravans. Of course, they were setting out today, weren't they? Where can they be going? What's over in that direction? They'll come to the coast if they keep on the way they're going. Let's ride over and have a look at them, shall we? Yes, good idea. The caravans make quite a splash of colour, don't they? Red, blue and yellow. Look, there's Sniffer's father. What a nasty piece of work he is. Good morning. Nice day. Where are you going? To the coast? It's nothing to do with you. Surly folk, aren't they? I wonder how they manage about food on this moor. Suppose they take it all with them. I'll ask them. How do you manage about food and water? We've got food there in that caravan. As for water, we know where the springs are. Are you camping?
sleeping on the moor for a long time? Well, it's nothing to do with you. Now clear off and leave us alone. Come on, Henry. They don't like us asking questions. They simply don't want to be friendly. That's their trouble. Never mind. I'm enjoying myself. The others were enjoying their day too, but they were not quite so happy as Henry. They kept wondering about George. They missed Timmy too. He should be trotting beside them, enjoying the day as well. They lost sight of the caravans after a time. Julian kept a track of the way they went, half afraid of being lost. They had a magnificent lunch about half past twelve, with no end of sandwiches, great slices of cherry cake, and ginger beer. Later, they found a round pool with a little spring of clear, fresh water, and then decided to make their way home. Julian led the way, his horse picking its own path over the heather. The others followed. Dick stopped after a while. Are you sure we're right, Jew? I don't somehow feel that we are. The moor is different here, rather sandy and not so much gorse. Yes, it does look a bit different. We seem to be going in the right direction. Let's go a bit more to the west. If only there was something to guide us. But this moor hasn't a thing that stands out anywhere. What's this then? What? Look. It seems like rails or something. Very old and rusty. Yes, you're right. But what were rails laid down here for? I can't think. I only saw them by chance. They're so overgrown. They must lead somewhere. Perhaps there's a quarry on the moor. That's it. It's very sandy here. Maybe there is a quarry. Well, that way behind us goes right out onto the moor. So this way must lead back to some town or village. Yes, you're right. In which case, if we follow the lines along, we'll get back to civilization sooner or later. The lines ran steadily over the moor, sometimes very overgrown, and in about half an hour they led down to Milling Green. Then, as the rails came to a sudden end, the four of them rode into a small cart road and back to the stables. George had had quite an interesting day. Sniffer arrived, asking after the horse again, which George told him might be ready by the next day. His father and the rest of the gypsies, having gone off onto the moor, Sniffer showed George around his caravan, and then showed her some of the special signs that gypsies use to leave messages for other gypsies. But by the time evening came, George was feeling very lonely. When the others arrived back, she stood there, not knowing whether to frown or to smile. The others made up her mind for her. Hello, George. We did miss you. How's your head? I hope it's better. Come and help stable the horses, George. Tell us what you've been doing. Did you really miss me? I missed you too. Sniffer came over for his horse. Oh, there's the supper bell. Are you hungry? You bet. How is Sniffer's horse then? I'll tell you at supper. Do you want any help, Henry? Er,、uh, no, thanks, George. It was a very jolly supper that evening. Captain Johnson was very interested to hear about the old railway line they had found. I never knew there was anything like that on the moors. Of course, we've only been here about fifteen years, so、uh, we don't know a great deal of the local history. You want to go and ask old Ben, the blacksmith, about that? He's lived here all his life. Well, we've got to take some of the horses to be shod tomorrow. We could ask him then. We saw the caravans too, George, when we'd got pretty far out on the moor. Goodness knows where they were heading. I've no idea what the attraction is for the gypsies either.、It、just beats me. I'd like to go after them and see what they're doing. All right, let's. But how? We don't know where they've gone. Well, Sniffer's going to join them tomorrow, or as soon as Clip his horse is all right for walking, and he's got to follow the patrons left on the way by the others. The what? Patrons. They're special signs that gypsies leave to pass on messages. 
I could ask him to leave plenty of patrons for us to follow. Well, it might be fun to see if we could read the right road just as easily as gypsies do. So next day, when Sniffer came for Clip, George asked if he would lay patrons that they could follow as a game. He agreed, and George went to fetch Clip. The rest seemed to have done the horse good, and he no longer limped as Sniffer rode off, giving one last, very loud sniff. Then George went to find the others, and suggested taking the horses that needed shoeing down to Old Ben the blacksmith. Old Ben was a mighty figure of a man, even though he was over eighty. He didn't shoe many horses now, but sat in the sun watching all that was going on. He had a great mane of white hair and eyes that were as black as the coal he had so many times heated to a fiery flame. Good morning, young masters and miss. And what can I be doing for you? We've got some questions to ask you. Ask away. If it's about this place, there's nothing much old Ben can't tell you. Give Jim your horses now. Ask away. Well, we went riding on Mystery Moor yesterday, and for one thing, we'd like to know if there's any reason for the curious name. Was there ever a mystery on that moor? Oh, there were plenty of mysteries away there. People lost and never come back again. But when my granddad was a boy, it was called Misty Moor. See, Misty, not mystery. And that was because of the sea fogs that came stealing in from the coast and lay heavy on the moor so that no man could see his hand in front of his face. I can see we'd better watch out for the mist if we go riding there then. Yes, you keep your eyes skinned. But why was the name changed to Mystery Moor? Well, now, that must have been about 70 years ago when I was a lad. Yes. That was when the Bartle family built the little railway over the moor. The railway line? That's right. Well, one of the Bartle family, Dan his name was, he found a mighty good stretch of sand out there on the moor. We thought there might have been a sand quarry. Yes. They got wagons and they went to and from the quarry they dug and they sold their sand for miles around. Good sharp sand it was. But what about the rails? Don't hurry him. They made a great deal of money and they set to work and built a little railway to carry an engine and trucks to the quarry and back. My, my, that was a nine days wonder, that railway. But why did the railway fall into ruin? Well, now you come to the mystery you keep on about. Those Bartles fell foul of the gypsies up on the moor. Oh, there were gypsies on the moor then too? Oh, aye, there's always been gypsies on the moor, as long as I can remember. It's said that those gypsies quarrelled with the Bartles, and the gypsies pulled up bits of line here and there, and the little engine toppled over. The Bartles weren't ones to put up with a thing like that, no. So they set about to drive all the gypsies off the moor. They must have been a very fierce family. You're right there. Nobody dared to cross them. But you can't cross the gypsies for long, that you can't. And one day all the Bartles disappeared and never came back. But what's happened? No one rightly knows. It happened in a week when the mist came swirling over the moors and blotted everything out. Nobody went up there except the Bartles. Nothing stopped those Bartles from working. One night, somebody in the village saw twenty or more gypsy caravans slinking through the village at dead of night up to the moor. And next morning, up to the quarry went the Bartles as usual. And they never came back. No, not one of them. But what happened? Search parties were sent out when the mist cleared. But not one of the Bartles did they find, alive or dead. Not one. And they didn't find any gypsy caravans either. They'd all come creeping back the next night and pass through the village like shadows. I reckon the gypsies sat upon the Bartles in the mist and took them and threw them over the cliffs into the sea. How horrible. Don't worry yourself. It all happened a long time ago. And there weren't that many that mourned those Bartles, I can tell you. It's a most interesting story, Ben. So Misty Moor became Mystery Moor then, did it? Didn't anyone work on the railway after that, or get the sand? No, not a soul. But you just remember two things. Watch out for that mist, and keep away from the gypsies on the moor. That afternoon, they decided it would be fun to see if they could make out the patrons that Sniffer told George he would leave. 
it proved quite easy to follow the patrons. Only once did they find any difficulty. Soon they found it unexpectedly easy to follow the caravan route, because the soil became sandy and there were many bare patches on which the marks of the wheels could plainly be seen. The wheel marks led steadily towards a little hill, and there were the caravans showing up well against the hill in their bright colours. Julian said to go and ask if Clip was all right. It would be a good excuse to go right into the camp. They cantered right up to the little group of caravans. Four or five men appeared as soon as they heard the sound of hooves, and Sniffer ran out. Hello, Clip's fine. Quite all right again. Get out of it. Did I hear Sniffer say that Clip's quite all right now? Over there. No need for you to see him. He's mended fine. All right, all right. We're not going to take him away. This is a nice sheltered spot you have here. How long are you staying? What's that to you? Nothing. Just a polite question. That's all. You better go before the dogs get you. All right, we're going. Make sure you do then. What's up with them? Anyone would think they're planning another Bartle affair. <gasps> oh, don't! They're planning something. All alone out here. They thought we were prying and spying. That's all. Poor old Sniffer. What a life he has. The next day brought a few things. It brought a letter for Henry that filled her with disgust. It brought a letter for Mrs. Johnson that made her start fussing and worrying. Henrietta's letter was from two of her great aunts. They announced that as they would be near the stables that day and the following, they would like to fetch her and take her out with them. Mrs. Johnson's letter was to tell her that the four children were coming unexpectedly, and she didn't know where to put them. But that particular problem was solved by Dick. It's easy. We'll simply take our tents, some food, and go and camp out on the moor by some spring. What could be nicer? Oh yes! Oh, Dick, that's a marvelous idea. Mrs. Johnson will get rid of us all, and Timmy too, and we'll have a lovely time all by ourselves, killing quite a lot of birds with one stone. Mrs. Johnson happily agreed, and they were soon ready to go. They went to find Henry to say goodbye. She stared at them mournfully. She had changed into a smart little coat and dress, and looked completely different. And very gloomy. What part of the moor are you going to? Up the railway? Yes, we thought we would, just to see where it goes. And we can't lose our way if we keep near the railway. Yes. Well, goodbye. For goodness' sake, don't stay away too long. We won't. Bye. Now we're off. Without that chatterbox of a Henry, she's really not too bad, George. All the same, it's fun to be on our own. Just the famous five together. It was a very hot day. The five had their lunch before setting out, as Mrs. Johnson said it would be easier to carry it inside than outside. They set off to the railway line, or where they hoped it would be, and eventually Anne discovered it by tripping over one of the rails. They went on and on up the line, and the soil began to look sandy. And the heather didn't grow so thickly. Soon there were big sandy patches with no heather or grass at all. I say, the lines end here. Look, they're broken, wrenched out of place. The engine couldn't go any farther. They may appear again later. I'll have a look. Why do they stop like that? I don't know. No sign of them around here either. That's peculiar, isn't it? Very. It's funny. We aren't at the quarry yet, are we? I thought the lines would run right to the quarry. So where is it? And why do the lines stop so suddenly here? You're right. The quarry should be near here. Well, there simply must be more lines somewhere. Ones that go to the quarry. Let's look for that first. We ought to see a quarry easily enough. But it wasn't really very easy to find, because it was behind a great mass of thick gorse bushes. Dick rounded them and stopped. Here it is! Come and look. 
My word, there's been some quarrying here for sand. They must have taken tons and tons of it. The sides are pitted with holes, see? There are even some caves. Sand caves. Well, we can shelter here if we have rain. I'd be a bit afraid of the sand falling in and burying me. It's quite loose and... I found the lines. Where? Here, let's follow them. They're broken here as well. But look, in those bushes, there's a pile of old rusty rails. I guess that's where the gypsies threw them the day they attacked the Bartles, perhaps. And whatever's that great lump over there with gorse growing on it? Let's see. Well, what do you know? It's the engine. The little engine old Ben told us about. It must have run right off the broken rails and overturned here. What a funny old-fashioned thing. And what a big funnel it has. The gypsies must have set on the Bartles in the mist, having first broken up the lines so the engine would run off and overturn. Anyway, they won the battle because not one of the Bartles ever returned. I hope we don't dream about this tonight. Yes. Where are we going to sleep? The quarry. That would be a good place to camp in. The sand is so dry and soft. Yes, let's. They settled down quite early to sleep. The boys took one side of the quarry, the girls the other. Tim, as usual, was on George's feet. And, as usual, he slept with one ear open. He heard a scurrying hedgehog. He heard frogs in a far-off pool croaking in the night. Nobody moved in the quarry. There was a small moon, but it gave very little light. Timmy's one open ear suddenly cocked itself right up. Then the other ear stood up too. A low humming sound came slowly over the night. Timmy woke properly. The sound was now very loud indeed. Dick woke and listened. What was that noise? An aeroplane? He woke Julian, and they both got up and went out of the quarry. It's an aeroplane, all right. What's it doing? Doesn't seem to be going to land. It's just circled round two or three times. Is it in trouble, do you think? Here it comes again. Look, what's that light over there? I don't know. It's not a fire. I think it may be some sort of guide for the plane. It seems to be circling round and about over that globe. Now it's made off. There it goes. But what can it have been doing? I thought the glow might have been to guide it into land, but it just circled and made off. Where would it have come from? From the coast, I suppose, from over the sea. I simply don't know. It beats me. And now the glow has gone. Oh, yes. Do you think it's anything to do with the gypsies? I don't know. Why should they have anything to do with the plane? Gypsies and planes don't seem to mix somehow. I think we'd better try and find out what that glow is. We could have a bit of a snoop tomorrow. Good idea. Come on, let's get back to the quarry. It's cold out here. The next day, Anne got the breakfast, and the boys told her and George all about the aeroplane in the night. Later, Julian and Dick went to stand where they had stood the night before, to decide in exactly what direction the glow had been. Then they set off over the moor. 
It was a day like summer, far too warm for April. They hadn't gone far when, near to a curious hill that stood up from the flatness of the moor, they saw a group of caravans standing in its shelter. It was the gypsies. The boys made their way towards the place where they thought they had seen the glow, some way to the left of the gypsies' camp and beyond it. There they discovered another old quarry like the one they had camped in, but smaller. And in the middle was something unusual. They scrambled down into the steep sides of the quarry and made their way towards it. It's a lamp. A powerful lamp of some sort. Like those we see making a flare path at an aerodrome. But why signal to a plane that doesn't land? Maybe the gypsy signalled that it wasn't safe to land for some reason. Well, it's a puzzle. I can't imagine what's going on. Something is. That's certain. Let's snoop around a bit. What are you doing here? You kids again? We're camping out on the moor for a night or two, and we heard a plane last night circling low. We also saw a glow that appeared to be guiding it. Did you hear the plane? Maybe we did. Maybe we didn't. What of it? Planes fly over this moor every day. We found this powerful lamp too. Do you know anything about that? Nothing. I can't believe you didn't see the light it gave last night. We don't know nothing about no lamp. This is our usual camping place. We don't interfere with anything or anybody unless they interfere with us. Then we make them sorry for it. Well, we're going now, so don't worry. We're only camping for a night or two. We won't come near here again if you object to us. They're all right, Father. Sniffer, what are you doing here? But they're all right. You know how Clip got his leg made better at the stables? Ah, get out of here. Ah. Hey, leave that kid alone. You've no right to hit him like that. Oh, yeah? Come on, Dick. It's time to go. What an unfriendly lot they are. Except poor Sniffer. And he was doing his best for us. Poor kid. They went back to the girls and told them what had happened. Anne was all for going back to the stables, but Julian said they should stay one more night. They had a lazy day. It was really too hot to do much, but they spent some time uncovering more of the little engine and its great long funnel. No gypsies came near them that day, not even Sniffer. The evening was as lovely as the day had been, and almost as warm. They went to sleep at last. But Dick awoke suddenly, feeling much too hot. Phew! What a night! He sat up cautiously, and thought he would just go to see if the big lamp was lit again, down in the pit by the gypsy's camp. He went to the edge of the quarry and climbed up, then gave a sudden exclamation. Yes, it was glowing again. And then he could distinctly hear a low humming noise from the east. He ran to wake Julian and the girls. The noise was now loud enough for them to search the starry sky for the plane. Dick managed to pick it out, thought it was coming down, but it wasn't. It merely swept low and then went round in a circle as it had done the night before. Then something extraordinary happened. Something fell, not far from Julian in the quarry. Something that bounced and then came to a rest. Are they trying to bomb us or something? Julian, what are they doing? Get down, quickly! Force yourselves into the cave somewhere or we'll be hit! It's going. Nothing's exploding, thank goodness. But what is the plane dropping? And why? This is a most peculiar adventure to have. It's probably a dream. No, not even a dream could be so mad. Come on, I want to see what the plane dropped. Well, it's a firm, flattish parcel done up well, sewn into a canvas covering. Let's have three guesses what's inside. Bacon for breakfast, I hope. Idiot! Where's my penknife? We'll soon see what's in them. That thing is coming undone there. Ah. Now, what have we got? It just seems to be piles of paper. Shine a torch over here, George. Who I say. Gosh, do you see what it is? American money. Dollar notes. One hundred dollar notes. And there are scores and scores of them in this one packet. 
Julian, how much is a hundred dollar note worth in our money? About fifty pounds, I think. But they've dropped dozens of packets. I know. Whatever's this all about? There must be thousands and thousands of dollars lying around us here in the quarry. Jew, hadn't we better get busy picking up these parcels? We certainly had. I'm beginning to see it all now. The smugglers come over in a plane from France, say, having previously arranged to drop these packets in a lonely spot on this moor. The gypsies are there to light the guiding lamp and pick up the parcels. I see, and then they quietly pack them into their caravans, slip off the moor, and deliver them to someone else who pays them well for their trouble. Very smart. That's about it. But I can't, for the life of me, see why dollar notes have to be smuggled here. They can be brought freely into the country. Stolen ones, perhaps. It's beyond me. But no wonder the gypsies didn't want us around. We better buck up and collect these parcels and get back to the stables with them. The gypsies will be after them. There's no doubt about that. We could put them in our rugs and tie up the ends and carry them like that. Good idea, George. Let's get going. Come on, quick! That must mean the gypsies are coming. For goodness' sake, hurry! Yes, the gypsies were certainly coming, and their dogs were with them, barking. The four children hurried out of the quarry, clutching rugs filled with parcels. They set off to where the lines ended, near where the old engine lay half buried. The gypsies saw them and yelled for them to stop, but the five didn't stop. They were now stumbling between the railway lines, glad of George's torch and Anne's. Quick! Oh, quick! They must be catching us up. Look round and see, George. No, I can't see anyone. Julian, everything looks peculiar. What's happening? Julian, stop! Something strange is happening. Gosh, you're right. How strange! There's a mist suddenly come up. It's even blotted out the stars. No wonder it seems so jolly dark. A mist? Not that awful mist that sometimes covers the moors. What a good thing we're on the railway lines. What shall we do? Go on. The gypsies won't come after us in this mist. I've a good mind to hide this money somewhere and then walk back to get the police. If we keep to the lines, we can't go wrong. Yes, let's do that. But where can we hide the money? In the old engine. The old engine. We'll stuff the packages down the great long funnel and stop it up with sand. Great idea. The gypsies will think we've gone off with the money, and we'll be halfway home by the time they try to catch us, if they dare brave this mist. Now there's no need for you two girls and Timmy to walk all the way to the engine with us. You sit here on the lines and wait for us to come back. We shan't be long. Julian and Dick went off together with Anne's torch. George kept hers. Timmy pressed close to her. Julian and Dick stepped cautiously away from the lines to where they thought the engine would be. They couldn't see the gorse bush, but they could feel it. They worked their way round to the engine's funnel and spent ten minutes ramming the packages into it. Then they filled it to the top with sand and made their way back to the rails. But they couldn't find them. Where were they? A small feeling of panic came into Julian's mind. Which way should they step now? How had they gone wrong? After ten minutes' search, the two boys sat back on their heels, the little torch between them. Now we're done for. I don't see anything for it but to wait till the mist clears. But what about the two girls? Let's try shouting for them. George, George! Anne. Was that Timmy? It came from that way. Oh, why did we leave the girls? Suppose this fog doesn't clear until tomorrow. What a horrible idea! But I don't think we need to worry about the girls, Jew. And dogs don't mind fog. Yes, I've forgotten, old Tim. Well, seeing as they'll probably be all right with Timmy to guide them, let's sit down and rest. Here's a good thick bush. Let's get into the middle of it if we can, and keep the damp out of us. Anne and George, meanwhile, were no longer where Julian and Dick had left them. They had waited and waited. And then had become very anxious indeed. They decided to go and get help by following the railway down to where they would have to break off for the stables. Walking slowly along, they kept closely to the railway lines. But after a while, George stopped, puzzled. That's funny. I don't remember the line being as badly broken as this. The lines simply stop. I can't see any more. Oh, George, you know what we've done. 
We'd come all the way up the lines instead of going down them homewards. How could we have been so mad? Look, this is where they break off. So the old engine must be somewhere near. Blow! It shows how we can lose our sense of direction in a mist like this. I can't see or hear anything of the boys. George, let's go to the quarry and wait there until daylight comes. I'm cold and tired. We could squeeze into one of those caves. All right, but for goodness sake, don't let's lose our way to the quarry. It came up so suddenly, didn't it? I can believe my... What's up, Tim? Can you hear something, Timmy? Nothing. Oh, no! Timmy! What's happened? Timmy, come here! Timmy, where are you? Ah! Right. Now, you come with me. You were warned not to snoop about on the moor. Where's my dog? What have you done to him? I knocked him on the head. He's all right, but he won't feel himself for a bit. Help! George! Anne! What have you done to Anne? Now, we've got her too. Now, you come along. Where's my dog? He's all right. But if you make any more fuss, I'll give him another blow on the head. What a night. The boy's gone, Timmy hurt, she and Anne captured, and this horrible mist all the time. But the mist cleared a little as they came near to the gypsies' camp. George and Anne saw the light of a fire, and more men gathered together. They were ruthless and angry, and began to question them. Where are the boys, then? We've no idea. Lost in the mist. We all went to go home, but we got separated, so George... I mean, Georgina and I went back to the quarry. Did you hear the plane? Of course. Now, did you see or hear it dropping anything? We didn't see anything drop. We heard it. What are you telling the man? Be quiet, you! Now, did you pick up what the plane dropped? Uh, oh, yes. We picked up a few strange parcels. What was in them? Do you know? Never you mind. And what did you do with the parcels? I didn't do anything with them. The boys said they would hide them, but they didn't come back. So we went to the quarry again... That's when you caught us. And where did the boys hide these packets? How do I know? We didn't go with them. Do you think they still got them? Why don't you find the boys and ask them? They probably lost on the moors. We'll look for them tomorrow. They won't get home in this. Take these girls away. Put them in the far cave and tie them up. Where's my dog? You bring me my dog. Yeah, well, you haven't been very helpful. We'll question you again tomorrow. And if you're more helpful, you should have your dog. Two men led the girls away from the fire and over to the hill. A passage led straight into the hill. It was honeycomb with passages. At last they came to a cave that must have been right in the heart of the hill, a cave with a sandy floor and a post that was driven deeply into the ground. Ropes were fastened firmly to it. The two girls looked at it in dismay. Surely they were not going to be tied up like prisoners. But they were... The ropes were fastened firmly round their waists and knotted at the back. It was stuffy and hot in there. George was worried to death about Timmy, but Anne was almost too worried to think. She fell asleep, sitting up uncomfortably with the ropes around her waist. George didn't go to sleep. She sat there worrying. Suddenly she thought she heard a noise, someone creeping up the passage. Oh, if only Timmy were here! It's Sniffer. Sniffer! I've been tied up here before, too. Sniffer, how's Timmy? Tell me, quickly! He's all right. He's just got a bad cut on his head. I bathed it for him. He's tied up, too. Sniffer, listen. Go and get Timmy for me. And bring a knife, too. Will you? Can you? Oh, I don't know. My father will half kill me. Sniffer, is there anything you want? Anything you've always wanted? I'll give it to you if you do this for me. I promise you. I want a bike, and I want to live in a house. I'll see to it that you get what you want. Only do, do go and get Timmy. Okay. Where's Timmy? I didn't dare bring him. He was tied up too close to my father. But I've brought you a knife. Look. Thank you, Sniffer. Listen, there's something important I'm going to do, and you've got to help. I'm scared. Think of that bicycle. A red one, perhaps, with silver handles. Mm. All right. What are you going to do? I'm going to write a note, and I want you to tie it onto Timmy's collar and set him free somehow. 
He'll run off back to the stables with a note, and then Anne and I will be rescued. My pencil and notebook's in my pocket. Will you do that? All right. <coughs> That's my father. Listen, if you cut your ropes and escape, can you find your way out? I don't know. I think I can. I'll leave Patrins for you. Look out for him. I'll hide in the cave next door till my father's gone. Then I'll go back to Timmy. Have you seen Sniffer? If I catch him in here, I'll whip him till he squeals. Sniffer? No, he, he's not here. What's that you writing? So, you're writing for help, are you? And how do you think you're going to get help, I'd like to know, huh? Who's going to take this note for you? Sniffer? No. Well, you can write another note now to those two boys, and I'll tell you what to say. No. Oh, yes, you will. I'm not going to hurt those boys. I'm just going to get back those packets from wherever they're hidden. Do you want your dog back safely? Yes. Well, if you don't write this note, you won't see him again. Now take your pencil and write what I say. Wait a minute. How are you going to get the note to the boys? The only way is to tie it on my dog's collar and send him to find them. If you bring him here, I can make him understand. Well, you write this then. We are prisoners. Follow... What's your dog's name? Timmy. Follow Timmy and he will bring you to us and you can save us. And then sign your name. Georgina. Yeah, sign Georgina. Go and get Timmy then and I'll write you the note. The man turned and went. George looked after him, her eyes bright. He thought he was making her play a trick on Julian and Dick to bring them to the cave so they could be threatened and questioned. But she was going to play a trick on him. Here he is. Oh, Timmy, does your head hurt you? I'll take you to the vet as soon as we get back. You can get back as soon as those boys are here and we know where those packets are hidden. Where's the note, then? Here. Hmm. Uh, uh. Well, looks all right. Well, let's tie it to his collar, then. All right. It's all right, Timmy. Right. Well, tell him where to go, then. Go to Henry, Timmy. Do you understand? Take this note to Henry. And you better tell him the other boy's name. No, I don't want to muddle him. Find Henry, Timmy, dear. Henry. Timmy padded off down the passage and Sniffer's father turned on his heel and went out too. Anne woke up and wondered where she was. George switched on the torch and explained what had happened. Then she cut the ropes and said they were to pretend they were still tied up if anyone came. Where were the boys? They were still under the bush, half sleeping. They hoped the girls were safely at home by now. Thank goodness Timmy was with them. But he wasn't, of course. He was padding across the misty moor all by himself, puzzled and with a badly aching head. Why had George sent him to Henry? He didn't like Henry, and he didn't think George did either. Oh, well. A little while later, he came to the stables and paused to think which was Henry's bedroom. Ah, yes. He padded upstairs, pushed open Henry's door, and put his paws on her bed. <coughs> What is it? Timmy, whatever are you doing here? Have the others come back? No, they couldn't have. Where have you come then, Timmy? What's this on your collar? Why, it's paper. A message. Follow Timmy and he will bring you to us and you can save us. Georgina. Timmy, is this note true? Are they prisoners? <coughs> oh, you're hurt, Timmy. Who did that to you? Yes, I know you want me to follow you, but I've got to think. If Captain Johnson was here, I'd go and fetch him. But he's away for the night, and I'm sure Mrs. Johnson would have a fright if I fetched her. I know. William. I'll get William to come with us. She dressed quickly, and then set off to William's room and woke him. He was most astonished at the note, and pointed out that George had signed her name Georgina. She wouldn't do that unless things were very urgent. Henry and William soon set off on horses, with Timmy leading the way. They didn't follow the railway, of course. Timmy didn't need to. 
he knew the way perfectly. Soon they came to the quarry, but led by Timmy went round it. They rode towards the gypsies' camp, and when Timmy slowed down, they took warning. Timmy's getting near wherever he wants to take us. We'd better dismount. Right. We'll tie the horses to this tree. All right. Lead on, Timmy. Where are they, boy? In here. Timmy, you've brought help. Henry, I'm so glad you've come. But why didn't you bring Captain Johnson? He's away. But William's here. Whatever's happened, George? Uh, what's happening? Henry! If you want to escape, you'd better come now. While the gypsies' camp is asleep. Timmy can guide us. Come on, Tim. Timmy? Oh, no, he's ill. He can't get up. Oh, Timmy, what's the matter? It must be that cut on his head. Can you carry him, George? I think so. But, George, we don't know our way out of here. Well, we'll simply have to have a shot at it. Which way is it? I can't remember. Look, there in my torchlight. What is it? A patron left by Sniffer. This way. Here's another. We go this way. Here's a patron again. We take this fork. And so it went on until they came safely to the entrance of the hill. How thankful they were to see the mist. At least it meant that they were in the open air. But then, just as they were making their way to where they had left the horses, the gypsies' dogs began to bark the place down. They've heard us. Buck up. We'll be stopped if we don't get off at once. I can see you over there with your torches. Now stop at once, do you hear me? Stop! Oh, come on! What about Timmy? Oh, Timmy, you're coming round. Thank goodness. Let me put you down. Let's get on these horses. Climb up behind William, George. And you get behind me, Anne. Right, let's go. Come back, you! Come back, I say! Come back now! The horses went off as fast as they dared in the mist. Timmy running in front. Somewhere behind the mist the sun was shining. Soon it would disperse the strange fog that had come up suddenly from the sea. George glanced at her watch. Good gracious, could it really be six o'clock in the morning? She wondered what had happened to Julian and Dick, and thought of Sniffer gratefully, and all the patrons he had left on the hill. In fact, about an hour earlier, Dick and Julian had had enough of the bush they were in, and set off stumbling in the dim light of their torch. Julian tripped against something hard and almost fell. He snatched the torch from Dick, and gave a delighted exclamation. It was a rail! It wasn't long then before they arrived back at the stables to awaken a very startled Mrs. Johnson, who was even more startled when she realised that George and Anne were missing. But this is serious, Julian. They might be completely lost on the moor. Or those gypsies might have got them. I must telephone my husband and the police too. Oh dear, oh dear. Why did I ever let you go camping out? Yes, hello. I want to report two missing girls. Yes, dear. As soon as you can. There. Captain Johnson's on his way, and so are the police. Now who's that? Horses. Who's riding them at this time of the morning? It's Anne. And George. Look. There they are. And to me too. With Henry and William. What is all this? Oh, Julian, Dick, you're back then. We did hope you would be. After you left us, we went back up the lines the wrong way and arrived at the quarry again. And the gypsies took us prisoner. But, but how do Henry and William come into this? And what's the matter with Timmy? Oh, dear, I'm sure I don't know what is happening. Timmy was half carried, half dragged up the stairs by William and George and Mrs. Johnson examined his cut carefully and bathed it. Soon there was the sound of horses' hooves again in the yard, and Captain Johnson arrived looking very anxious. 
At almost the same moment, a police car slid in at the gates with two policemen, who had been sent to inquire about the missing girls. Mrs. Johnson had forgotten to say that they had arrived. Oh, dear. I'm sorry to have bothered you, Sergeant. The girls have just arrived back, so there's nothing to worry about. Wait! I think we shall need the police. Something very peculiar has been happening up on the moor. Really? What's that? We were camping there, and a plane came over very low, guided by a lamp set by the gypsies. But why should they need to guide a plane? It came to drop packages. Oh, it did, did it? For the gypsies to pick up, by any chance? Yes, but the plane's aim wasn't very good, and the packets fell all around us. And did you uh, pick up any of these packages? Yes, we did. And I opened one. What was in it? Paper money. Dollars. In one packet alone, there were scores of hundred-dollar notes. Well, well. That explains a lot that's been puzzling us, doesn't it, Wilkins? It certainly does. So that's what happens. That's how the gang gets the dollars over here, from that printing press in northern France. Just a nice little run in a plane. But why do they throw packets down for gypsies to collect? Surely anyone can bring dollars here. Not forged ones, my lad. Phew, I never thought of them being forged. Oh, yes. We've known of this gang for some time. Though we didn't know how they brought the notes here. But now we know. My word, this is a pretty scoop, Sergeant. And where exactly are these packages, may I ask? We hid them. Down a funnel. Down a funnel? By the time the police and everyone got to the quarry, the gypsies were already moving their caravans out. The sergeant gave word that every gypsy was to be watched if he left his caravan, because one of them was sure to lead the police to the gang that passed the forged notes. Julian and Dick led the sergeant and Wilkins to the old engine. They were amazed to see the packages hauled up from such a peculiar hiding place. My word, this is some haul. You kids have certainly put us onto something. I'm glad. Oh, we'd better collect all the things we left here yesterday, hadn't we? We went off in such a hurry and left all our things in the quarry. Come on, George, help us with this lot. What's up with Timmy? Jew, there must be someone here. Is it one of the gypsies, do you think? There's someone in that cave. Sniffer, come out. I know you're in there. I got away from them. You sure I could have a bike? And so you shall, Sniffer. I can't go back to my father. He'll half kill me. We'll do the best we can for you. Oh, no. Over there. The police. Don't let them get me. Don't run away, Sniffer. It's all right. <laughs> Funny little thing. Well, I should imagine that his father will be sent to prison for his share in this affair, so Sniffer will get his wish and leave the caravan life to live in a house. And I shall keep my word and take some money out of my savings bank and buy him a bicycle. They all went back to the stables to find that it was now almost lunchtime and that everyone had a large appetite to match the large lunch Mrs. Johnson had prepared. The girls went upstairs to wash. George went into Henry's room. Henry, thanks most awfully. You're as good as a boy any day. Thanks, George. You're better than a boy. <laughs> <laughs>